and welcome to The Nexus and part two of the John McAfee story. In Monday's episode, we looked at how the so-called godfather of the entire antivirus software industry was found dead in his prison cell in Spain. He'd just been told that Spain had agreed to extradite him to the United States on tax fraud charges. The 75-year-old internet pioneer, who was once estimated to be worth $100 million, led a wild life of partying and excess, potentially face spending the rest of his life behind bars. The reports and rumors from the jail are that he killed himself, but his wife, his lawyer, and some of his best friends don't believe that for a minute. John McAfee was not suicidal. I spoke with him a few hours before he was found dead. We spoke about the court's decision to extradite him to the US. It did not come as a surprise to either of us. We were prepared for that decision and had a plan of action already in place to appeal that decision. I blame the U.S. authorities for this tragedy. Because of these politically motivated charges against him, my husband is now dead. His last words to me were, I love you and I will call you in the evening. Those words are not words of someone who is suicidal. Let's bring in our guest now, and Mark Eglinton is an author who spent seven months talking every day to John McAfee back in 2019 in order to tell his story, the life and times of John McAfee, known as No Domain, the John McAfee Tapes. Mark Eglinton, welcome back again. Um, Thank you. Let's, let's start at the beginning. Why did you reach out to John McAfee, or was it the other way around? It was actually a bit of a combination of things. Uh... I reached out to him primarily because this is my job. I write about interesting people. And when I was thinking of interesting people, I couldn't think of anyone more interesting than John McAfee. So I messaged him on Twitter, uh, asked him how about an autobiography. He said, how much will it cost me? I said, nothing. And he said, send me some examples of your work to my email and we'll go from there. And that's what we did. We, we, we started up a dialogue by email and within two or three days, we'd agreed to do this book, which he, he tried to do in the past. He had attempted to write an autobiography or had enlisted people to help him to do it a few times. But yeah. for one reason or another, that had never happened. So, so I was going to it knowing that I wasn't the first, but also hoping that I would be the person that he ended up working with. And that's how it turned out. Now, Mark, this happened in 2019. Um, he was already on the run by then? He was in hiding by then. He had run. Uh, he, had, he had boarded the yacht in the U.S. He'd gone to the Bahamas. He'd gone to Cuba, gone to the Dominican Republic, had been apprehended and, and took the, the option to be extradited back to the U.K. at that point, given that he was a dual citizen. From there, he went dark. And from that point, he was on the run. And from shortly after that, he was in hiding in a place that he never told me where, where this place was. Uh, I, I kind of figured it out yeah. based on time zones, but he was he was in Europe. Ah, now, he was surprisingly open to the press for a man who was on the run. Uh, we, uh, our interview producer contacted him, and he actually agreed to do the interview. And to my eternal regret, uh, we never got round to it. You, on the other hand, you grabbed the opportunity, but mm -hmm. how did you gain his trust? <laughs> Very quickly. He said to me, right, uh, we, have, we had one conversation uh, about some of his early life. I can't remember exactly which part of the life it was. And he said, write me up a couple of pages. Uh, so I wrote a couple of pages up. I wanted the job. Obviously, I wanted the job. So I wrote a couple of pages up, sent them over, and he said, you're the man. And from that point, we had trust. Uh, we never made an agreement in, in, in any formal terms. We just yeah. said, let's do this. And if that's how it proceeded. And we, we, came, we became very good friends in a couple of days. Uh, we were we became very familiar, sending each other messages, and, and from that point on, onwards, it was a very easy relationship. Right. Now, he actually confided in you in a way he hadn't done before, and it brought about some mm. very emotional moments. You, you've told me he, he cried uh, on several occasions for uncontrollably for minutes. Um, what part of his life absolutely formed him, and something that you know others haven't perhaps been told about? Yeah, I mean, John was very emotional. I, th I think to answer your question, I think it was a real burden for him to, or a release of a burden, rather, for him to talk to me uh, in, in this way. And he said to me, he stopped me on many occasions during our conversations and said, you know what, this is great. 
And I said, why is it great? He said, because I've never talked to anyone like this before. I've never felt like I can talk to anyone like this before. So obviously that's a real endorsement that you carry on with if you're, if you're an author. But uh, his childhood was very difficult. His father was abusive. His father was a former U.S. airman. Uh, his father drank. His father was abusive to his mother and to him. And when John was 15, his father committed suicide uh, by gunshot. And I remember asking John, thinking this would be a moment in the book where he would cry, how that moment felt. And he told me that rather than being a moment of great sadness, he was actually quite relieved because he felt that his last, the last person who would ever lord over him uh, had gone. So I think his father's death, while in later life he might have looked back upon it as being a sad moment, certainly at the time he didn't. Uh, and it wasn't moments like that that made him cry, which was a surprise to me. There was there was mm. moments that I wouldn't have assumed would be upsetting that were. Now, he was actually born in England, and his father was an American airman, as you said. His mother was English. They moved yeah. to the United States when he was around six. Is that right? Yeah. And from then, well, from as he says, from his father's death, he then felt liberated to pursue everything, uh, well, I don't know, to excess. But anyway, success came in a major way when he established uh, McAfee Associates. Mm. He was the first one to see the opportunity of bringing out antivirus software. Um, sure. What was the genius in that move? How did he recognize that, that there was such a need for that and he got there ahead of everyone else? Yeah, well, it, it actually started before then because John, uh, prior to McAfee Associates, did, did some contracting work for various companies, one of them NASA, couple of other computer companies and he realized that he had a real uh he had a real partiality for mathematics and also by extension computer code and he found that for for the companies he was working for he could do work that would take other people two or three weeks in a matter of hours so he he, he realized that he had an uncanny ability with maths and code and this was at a time when code was only being just really i mean this was the beginning of the computer age so we talk about McAfee Associates, but this was an accidental company that was created. He did never, at no point did he ever want to create a company and be a, be a corporate businessman. That wasn't his intention. He liked the siege of, you know, battling the virus makers, which who came on the scene at that time, but he wanted no part of the business part of it. He only wanted to do the code and the, the fixing and the, the really stressful work that came with trying to repel virus makers. He, he was said once to be worth a hundred million dollars. Was it the money that motivated him or something else? Not at all. I don't think the money did motivate him. I mean, even prior to McAfee Associates, all the, all the contracting jobs he did. And at that time, programmers were like gods. They could be paid an enormous amount of money for a six month contract. John only ever earned money in order to facilitate living. He didn't earn money to create wealth uh, uh, and to sort of forward a career. His money making was solely so he could live. Uh, and when he ran out of money, he went back and did another contract and he, he carried on like that. And that was the case with McAfee Associates. He, he didn't sell. I mean, he, he, he simply took his share from the, the flotation of the company when it yeah. was float on the stock exchange and walked away. He's basically a very rich software guy, internet guy. Normally, those kinds of people are, you know, suited and booted, or they're geeks, they're wedded to the corporate world. Yeah. But he was nothing like that. He was sort of a, a rock star, if you like. And then he went to Belize. Why did he go to Belize? And what kind of a life did he lead there? I think Belize was, uh, Belize was this opportunity to go and kick back, relax, retire, have a fishing boat. That was that was the aim. He bought a property online without ever having seen it uh, in 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 the flesh, as it were. Went down there, set himself up in a, a very touristy part of the of of Belize. A lot of American tourists engaged in the community, invested in the community, lived a very quiet life, and was getting on just fine. That was the aim. The, the reason he went down there in the first place, he was doing that for the first part of that time in Belize. Now, some of the people who followed his life in Belize, uh, journalists in particular, have compared him to some sort of godfather or perhaps um, 
Colonel Kurtz from Apocalypse Now or from um, the Heart of Darkness. Um, you asked him about that, didn't you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, he told me about his situation in Belize and what happened. Uh, and to paraphrase that, he moved into the jungle and tried to fix problems in local villages. And I said, you're just living Heart of Darkness. And at the time, he said, that's just ludicrous. That's just not what's happened. That's not what happened there. Uh, Heart of Darkness is a story of psychosis. And I said, yeah, I know. This is this is what happened to you. And in, in the end, he agreed. Right. He said, basically, I did live my own Heart of Darkness. Yeah. And in the end, he had to leave. He was flushed out of the jungle. Can I ask you about um, what everyone seems to remember about him, that he was suspected of murdering his neighbor? So we turn now to the strange tale of an American tech mogul at the center of an international murder mystery. John McAfee, a software savant whose name was synonymous with security, is now becoming synonymous with the mysterious murder of McAfee's neighbor, Greg Fall, overnight Saturday here in Belize. And tonight, 48 hours after his neighbor Fall was shot point blank in the back of the head, McAfee is on the run. What's the truth about that? Yeah, John didn't murder his neighbor. Uh, we had conversations extensively about that. Uh, he 100% believed that the Belizean government were framing him. Uh, he was never charged with anything in Belize. Uh, they weren't going to turn up and shoot him. He believed that the Belizean government were going to concoct a subtle, sly, implication-type situation in order, to, uh, in order to frame him for a crime simply because they didn't like what he was doing in Belize. That is, that is John's belief, and I, and I agreed with that. I, I saw there was nothing in John's uh, delivery to me or anything he said that made me think anything different. Yeah. Can I just uh, read out one of his final tweets uh, from jail? There is so much sorrow in prison disguised as hostility. The sorrow is plainly visible even in the most angry faces. I'm old and content with food and a bed, but for the young, prison is a horror a reflection of the minds of those who conceive them. Uh, quite philosophical, and he's probably hit the nail on the head there, but do you believe him when he says, I'm old and content with food and a bed? Yeah, I think John had very simple needs when he... Knew, I mean, he was a chameleon in that respect. He could build houses in Ecuador for $20 million, never live in them. Equally, he could survive in a camper van in Mexico for a year, which he did when he was younger. Yeah. John was an adapter. John was somebody who could survive in any circumstances. John was somebody who was very happy and very content with himself. I've never met anyone more comfortable in his own skin than John McAfee. So it wouldn't surprise me if he could adapt to a prison cell and the food and the bed. That, that would be John for me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, obviously you're quite the admirer, but there are a lot of people who hate him. Uh, those who hated him... They had various reasons, but uh, and we've discussed some of them. Why did some people hate him? Uh, I, well, just I would just say that I'm not a total admirer. There were there were aspects of John that I didn't agree with. Uh, I, I didn't completely buy into all his philosophy, but what I did buy into was the fact that I think John McAfee was one of these people that almost all of us can relate to in some way. He was a guy being blown around by the wind. He was a guy who was living what I would say is the true essence of life. He wasn't creating a career. He wasn't pretending to be anybody else. He was just living. And I think every one of us, and me included, I mean, I, I really was fascinated by that idea of how you can just live. And uh, granted, you need money and you need means, but the principle of just living was something that was really appealing to me. And I think some people are threatened by that. Honestly, I do. And I think his detractors, They've got a real problem with somebody who can buy yachts, who can buy houses and just walk away. I and think it, I think it uh, unsettles people. Yeah, he was obviously a very brave man. He didn't really uh, give in to fear or insecurities. He just did his thing. I guess he had the self-confidence to go yeah. bust, to go broke, to try new things and let it all blow up if necessary. And he had the confidence that he would get back up on his feet. Um, yep. you, you, you say you learned a lot from him. What's the greatest lesson you've ever learned from him? I think self-confidence, uh, I think we all have sort of self-esteem issues. You, you worry about what people think of you. I think that's inevitable in life nowadays. I had a degree of that. I have a lot less than speaking to John. Uh, John taught me how to just be myself, to not worry about what people think and to do what it is I want to do to live. Not just that. The other great skill he had was understanding people. He gave me a glimpse into an era where older people... Uh, 
like my grandparents or whatever, had a degree of wisdom that I don't see around very much nowadays. And I couldn't get enough of John's conversation in that respect. He, he had so much wisdom about life, about the nuances of human nature, of his human nature, of mine. He laid it all out there uh, in a way that was incredibly honest. Mark, I'd just like to read you one of his final tweets and then bring in our second guest of the show. The US believes I have hidden crypto. I wish I did, but it has dissolved through the many hands of Team McAfee. Your belief is not required. And my remaining assets are all seized. My friends evaporated through fear of association. I have nothing, yet I regret nothing. And at this point, we can bring in Charles Nader now. Uh, Charles's company uses cryptocurrency and he engaged the services of John McAfee as a cryptocurrency influencer to raise the profile of his company, uh, as he is doing right now for that shameless promotion. Charles, yes. uh, let me <laughs> ask you, why did you reach out to John McAfee of all people? Well, at the time he was, he was ranked the number one influencer in the cryptocurrency space by Coindesk. And, you know, as any tech entrepreneur, you always want to have the best people advise you. And John at the time was the number one influencer in the cryptocurrency space. So that's how we initially decided to, to uh, reach out to him. Yeah. And what did he bring? You met him quite a few times, right? You met him throughout 2018 and 2019. You met him in Dallas, Tennessee. You met him on a blockchain cruise, which doesn't sound like something I'd like to be on. Uh, North Carolina and the Bahamas. You've had quite a wide range of encounters with him. Um, what sticks out for you? What could he offer you that no one else could? Well, definitely uh, John McAfee, may you rest in peace, I, I miss him. He, he was a legend, you know, he was a person that really started the whole antivirus industry and also created the freemium model, just so many, so many uh, great things that he did. And, you know, having some, someone of that profile uh, give you insight into what what they think is the future um, is really important. And for us, we're combining healthcare services at Doc.com with crypto with a crypto economy, a crypt our own cryptocurrency. It was a very innovative thing. But we the reason we did it was because we were always um, trying to optimize the transparency of data transactions. Since healthcare is such an important thing and healthcare data so sensitive. We use blockchain technology to make that a transparent process and publicly verifiable for everybody. And that was a key element that uh, Mr. McAfee, that's how I used to call him, mm. um, that was a key thing that he was very uh, pro, you know, he, he was a big supporter of anything that could become decentralized and would take out control from governments or centralized control. And uh, data transparency was one of those things. So that's why he, he liked how we combined our services with with a crypto economy, and that's where you know it came together. He he mentioned our product multiple times. Um, he talked about us. I went to see him many times. We became good friends, had amazing conversations about life, uh, technology, and right. many things in general. By that time, he was already in his seventies, but he still had that rebel streak in him. Um, he wanted to run. Well, he did, didn't he? Run ran for president. Was it as the libertarian candidate? Uh, so I could see yes. that he would be interested in decentralizing things, taking power away from central government and, and democratizing it. Was that, that was a genuine motivation for him? That was a genuine motivation for him. He wanted to make sure that corruption was eliminated by the use of blockchain technology. Um, we know that blockchain technology has that potential, but you, you really do need to get the word out. You need to tell people what the potential, what the reach of that technology is. And he was really for that. You know, it, for him, it was it was part of his legacy. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to leave a legacy of uh, something positive for the, for, for the world that would live on after his death. The blockchain is the first world-changing technology in the past 100 years that did not come from the bowels of a secret government development, didn't come from the CIA, did not come from Samsung or Apple or IBM. It came from ordinary programmers. Governments are just now starting to see the blockchain and cryptocurrency 
as an opportunity or a threat uh, or something to fear. And it is all of those, all three. He was accused of manipulating the value of cryptocurrencies. Do you know anything about that? Well, cryptocurrencies still to this day are a wild west. I would say anyone that's um, willing to invest in the cryptocurrencies, do your due diligence, research well, don't listen to just one person, um, you know, listen to a whole bunch, do your own due diligence. Um, and so, you know, him, as well as all the other influencers go into this box of who is doing what. And since he was a number one, you know, they, they showcased him as the bad guy. But re in reality, this happens, you know, there's people in the cryptocurrency space in multiple parts of the world always trying to manipulate things. That's the reality that like we're who? living. Like who? And who's manipulating the value of cryptocurrency? Oh, well, it could be the Chinese, it could be the uh, Russians, it could be the U.S. themselves, you know, all these regulatory things any, that any come American, out. Any American tech entrepreneurs you'd like to put a finger on? Well, I would say, I would say, hey, you know, I'm not, I, I don't want to say it's a bad thing, but, you know, yeah. Elon Musk is a great example. You know, he's, he, if he tweets something, well, that, you know, Dogecoin goes up. So is that manipulation or not? Well, <laughs> you know, you could consider it. Some could consider it not. So I, Mr. McAfee was of the same sorts. You know? Charles, I'm intrigued because uh, everybody wants to know who founded Bitcoin. Actually, not everybody wants to know. Some people want to know who founded Bitcoin. He told you. Yeah that he actually knew and he told you the name. Yes, he did, um, which after, you know, thinking about uh, our conversations, he told me, he told me it was the, the, the Satoshi Nakamoto had access to a lot of capital that he bought a boat and now he was living part time of the year in the Mediterranean and he would just spend his time with his family and be low key. And I thought, well, that's quite interesting to, you know, think of Satoshi Nakamoto living that kind of lifestyle. Because if you look at the, the, the coins that are his that he that we know for a fact that are his, they haven't moved since the creation of, of Bitcoin. Um, so, so we're, you know, could be on, some Charles. other things. That he's Hang doing on, Charles. Hang on, Charles. Yes, but I he told you his real name, and you, I, you don't want to share it now. Well, the thing is, look. Everybody already not, knows. Everybody already knows this name. It's out there. Tell us who it is. Okay. Well, uh, Mr. McAfee told me, and this is something that I'm not going to say it's 100. percent He told me it, it, it was Nick Zabo. Nick Zabo designed Bitgold about a decade before Bitcoin, which has been called the predecessor for the Bitcoin architecture. Now. Uh, there was some talks after that where I questioned him and there was some doubt. So I think he could have just potentially been using it as a, as a, you know, method of getting more attention because he yeah. used to be a master at that. You know, right. everyone knew. Um, then again, th they, he never showed me any proof. He just told me these stories and what he knew. Well, and I thought, well, it could be true. The, the level of person he was, who knows, you know, maybe he does so. Right now, look, sorry to put you on the spot like that. Let's talk about an anecdote that is really fascinating. I, I know you had several fascinating encounters with him. Tell us about the time and where and when it was that he suddenly had to go on the run. Um, I ironically went to meet him, you know, for a business um, in his house in North Carolina. And every time I would go see him, it was always, uh, I would prepare myself for an adventure. Uh, you know, I had a list of questions. I always liked to ask him. We used to go into talks for hours. Uh, that one night, though, he got notification that, you know, he, he was being uh, pursued by the government for taxes and things. And it just coincided with the fact that I was visiting that that week. So the day after they decided he decided to uh, go into exile. Didn't he offer you his house at a at a bargain price? Oh, yes, of course. Of course, you know, that, that was one thing about Mr. McAfee. He would just he didn't have any attachment to material things. Right then and there, the day after, they said, Charles, would you like to buy this house? It was, uh, I think it was $800,000. That's what they had paid for it. He said, we'll sell it to you for half price right now. And I was like, well, you know, I, to make a purchase like that for me was a little bit uncomfortable at that moment. But they just wanted to get everything out, get everything liquidated. And because in reality, people think he had a lot of money, but a lot of that money was stolen. I mean, at least that's what I saw with my eyes. Um, you know, the, he, he had a... Uh, people around him that took a lot of money. So 
he tried to fire sell the house and he sold it three days after. I think he sold it to one of the guys from the group of uh, Jordan Belfort from the Wolf of Wall Street. I think he was one of the guys that bought the house, but he had many friends that were wealthy and, uh, you know, he offered the house to many people. So that was just an incredible thing. You thought, well, I was here for a week and now this, they're selling me the house for half price. You know, Charles, it, it sounds like your encounters w with him were absolutely mind blowing. We could go on with, I think, with your anecdotes. Uh, there's a lot you're not telling us, I imagine, just to spare everybody's blushes. Charles Nader, yes. Mark Eglinton, thank you so much, both of you, for your uh, memories of uh, John McAfee. Much appreciated. Thank you. And thank you at home and on your phones for watching. Remember, you can see this episode, the previous one that started it all off uh, from last week as well, on our channel on YouTube. Just type in Nexus TRT World. Till next week, then, goodbye.